Welcome back to another high yield video. My name's John. I'm going to walk you through the high yield sciences that are tested on the MCAT and how they're most frequently tested. So I'll show you everything to pay attention to. And today we're going to be talking about, well, what are we talking about? You see what I did there? We're talking about memory. So short term, long term, a working memory, things like that. So I'm going to show you a graphic that we include in our high yield MCAT topic textbook. If you want to check that out, it'll be the first link in the description. And I'm going to teach from this graphic because it's really all you need to know. We're going to flesh out some topics here and there, but the main thing that I want you to focus on during this video is the timing of these, of these events because that is how the MCAT will typically question you. They'll say that you remembered something for 30 seconds. What type of memory were you using? You will have to know that 30 seconds is less than a minute, but it's greater than a couple seconds. So it has to be short term memory. It's easy enough, right? But if you don't know it, you're not going to get the question right. So there'll be a lot of stuff like that through this video. So make sure you stay around to the end. I love the topic of memory because it's crazy to me that, that, that our brains can fit so much in them. But we're really not going to get into too much of the, the cool sciencey stuff. This is not a neuroscience portion of memory. We're really just going to get into definitions. And I'm just going to teach you some easy ways to keep these definitions straight because this is how the MCAT will test them. They are going to test them by giving you a example and asking you which type of memory that fits. And if you don't know the definitions for those type of memories, you're just going to get the question wrong. There's really no way to reason to them because they're essentially one word definitions. So let's walk through this graphic first. Let me tell you what we wanted the authors to kind of illustrate and then we'll go about how to memorize all these. What this is talking about is Let's say you get a um, sensory stimuli. Let's let's just say a good-looking person will will grin at you, and you're gonna remember that, right? That's gonna be your sensory stimuli. Well, in order to memorize that 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 happened, that experience or that memory has to go through several types of memory before it's stored in our long-term memory, and if it's not, if the interruption, if this flowchart is ever broken then it does not get turned into a long-term memory. And that's how we forget some things. So the first type of memory that it gets converted into is something called sensory memory. And that gets split into two types of memory. One of them is iconic and one of them is echoic. Iconic sensory memory is your ability to remember how something looked for less than one second. And it's usually just long enough to react to it. It's, it's Memory almost seems like a bit of a misnomer here because it's for less than a second, but that's the technical definition. So I always think of it as if you look to your left really quickly, go ahead, do it. Just look to your left really quickly. Now, can you picture what you saw. Okay, so for that one second, you could, it, it was less than one second, you could picture what you saw. That is iconic memory. Now, I remember that because iconic sounds like iconic, meaning you can see it with your eyes. Now, because we focused on that, I, was, I, I literally looked at a doorknob, because I focused on that, I transitioned what that memory looked like to my short-term memory. And we'll come back to short-term memory a little bit longer, but if you're if you're sitting there thinking, okay, but I just, I remember the half-eaten sandwich that I just looked at, and I'm remembering it for longer than a second. Why is that? Well, it's because you transitioned it over by focusing on it. Echoic memory, so let's just say that um, you're thinking, man, this guy on YouTube has a very high-pitched voice, and you can remember how I sound um, for like two or three seconds after it, that's going to be echoic or auditory. And I just think of that because an echo is a sound, echoic auditory. Kind of makes sense to me. About two to three seconds. But really and truly, the MCAT tests you by less than one second. And the buzzword that they use a lot, and I actually saw this on my real test, was immediately. So on my test, they said something about how um, there's an individual that saw a wolf. It was a really weird scenario. They saw a wolf and they were like, what type of memory is them seeing a wolf and immediately having that memory encoded? It was the weirdest worded stem ever, but I could tell just what they were trying to get at. They were trying to get at iconic, I think, <laughs> maybe I missed it, um, but I think they were trying to get at iconic memory. 
because it's less than one second. So let's say you can focus on this, this nasally dude's voice on YouTube and you transition that memory from sensory memory to short-term working memory. So what is your short-term memory? This is something that we've heard a lot. So if sensory memory is the transient memory traces of our surroundings, whether those be iconic or echoic, short-term memory is actually a small amount of information that's stored in our conscious recollection. So generally speaking, your sensory memory is not something that you can consciously bring about. It's just how we move through the world. But the short-term memory is something that you can keep in mind. So example, imagine that you go to Target and uh, let's say that we still use cash. Um, so you, you get there and you buy like a dog bone and you know maybe like like a pack of candy like some sour strips or something like that and maybe like one or two plates and the total is four hundred sixty five dollars and twenty one cents you're gonna remember that for a little bit until you swipe your card or you pay your cash or whatever and then if you get to the car and your wife says, how much was that? You're gonna be like, oh, I don't know. Let me pull out the receipt and check it out. Well, I remembered it long enough to pay for it, which is my short-term memory, but I didn't remember it long enough to tell her how much it was once I got into the car. So your memory is a small amount of in information that you can consciously recall. And something that's tested frequently on the MCAT, the two things about the short-term memory that are tested frequently on the MCAT, number one, is the amount of time and if you google this you're going to get several different um, answers and some people say that short-term memory can last up to five minutes um, some people say it's one minute um, which means it's not an agreed upon science now this is one that the mcat will still test on but if it's not an agreed upon science then the mcat is not going to give you something like two minutes or something that's kind of in the gray area okay if they want something to be sensory memory they're going to make it less than one second. If they want something to be short-term memory, they're gonna make it less than one minute. If they want something to be long-term memory, it's gonna be like at the very least several hours, but more than likely they'll say something like months later you remember this or days later you remember your prescription. That's long-term memory. So that's the first thing that they test on is how long does short-term memory actually last? The other thing that they test on short-term memory is this seven plus or minus two items. And so if you've ever wondered why phone numbers are seven digits, this is the thought process that um, leads to that. And it's that the average person can remember seven plus or minus two unrelated items. So in a list, you can remember seven plus or minus two unrelated things. Now that's the average person. Some people can't remember, you know, five. And then you've got some people that can remember tons. If you see seven plus or minus two, your answer is probably either going to be short-term memory or working memory. Just make sure that you're taking the whole question into account. Now that begs the question, what is the difference between short-term memory versus working memory? Now for the sake of the MCAT, they're not going to ask you to split the hair. They're not going to have short-term memory and working memory as an answer because they are very difficult to um, differentiate between. Technically they're different because working memory revolves around the execution of cognitive tasks whereas short-term memory just involves the cognitive process of actual awareness, conscious recollection of that cognitive information. But for the MCAT the two can be used interchangeably. Now something that is unique about working memory specifically is that working memory can actually be characterized by the type of information that it's encoding. And so it can be thought of in three separate types. And, and this is actually something that's tested. So the three ways that working memory is characterized are through something called the central executive phonological loop and the visuospatial sketch pad. I don't know who came up with those names, but to tell between them, the central executive, you can just think of CEO. So it doesn't really do anything. It just bosses things around. It just tells other people what to do. So the central executive, all it does is divert the information to one or the other. So it's either saying that the information belongs in the phonological loop or it belongs in the visual spatial sketch pad. The phonological loop organizes information of the auditory system. You can remember that by, you know, 
phone, auditory, you talk on your phone, and that's an auditory experience. And the visual spatial sketch pad is things that you see. So this organizes like visual or spatial um, information. Um, and you can kind of, if, if you're seeing a close parallel between the phonological loop and the uh, echoic sensory memory and the visual spatial sketch pad and the iconic memory, that's because they're, they're both related to one specific system, whether it be visual or auditory, but they're actually very different subsets of memory and that's something that we'll be tested on often so for example let's say that you get a question that says that um, you remembered a noise for 30 seconds which type of memory is allowing you to do that well in the answer choices they're going to have echoic and they're going to have the phonological loop so you have to ask yourself okay well how long did they say it was and well they said it was 30 seconds so that's greater than one second so you can cross out echoic and that leaves you with phonological loop. So that's a way that they might actually test the concept of working memory. Now once you have these memories you can rehearse them um, whether this just be through something called maintenance rehearsal which is like you know chanting a phone number over and over again so that you never forget it. Or you can do something called elaborative rehearsal which is the idea of actually making the material meaningful to you uh, so that it sticks. If you're studying, you should do the elaborative rehearsal, but those really aren't super high yield. Maintenance rehearsal versus elaborative rehearsal are not very high yield, but what they do is they allow us to encode, which means to transfer memory from the short term into the long term. So what's important about long-term memory? Long-term me memory's time span is very important. It's theoretically infinite, or I guess as long as you live. Um, again, the MCAT will not give you a scenario, a scenario of like 10 minutes or even like five minutes and ask you which one it fits in. They're either gonna say something like 45 seconds or a minute or less than one second or immediate or you know, 20 years or, or an hour or something that's like a large scale of time if they're trying to get to the long term. So the timing of how long the memory stays around is very important for long term memory. And then the different types of memory are very important. So I've got these listed in this figure. I want to go through them really quickly, but make sure that you could identify a scenario or a type of memory and place it into the basket as to which of these subtypes of long-term memory it should fit in. And so for declarative memory, declarative memory is going to be explicit. And some types of declarative memory are going to be episodic, which is going to be like a specific time period or a specific thing that happened in your life. Um, like when I got married, like my wedding, that is an, that is, if, if my life was a sitcom, John's wedding would be, you know, the end of season three. That would be an episode in the sitcom. And so that's how I remember episodic, because it's a personal experience or your history. It's an episode in your life. Semantic is general knowledge about the world. So I just filmed a video on the immune system, and I was really struggling to remember what is important for the MCAT versus what have I had to learn from medical school? All these facts that you're memorizing for med school, even the facts that you're memorizing right now, those are semantic facts. So they're de declarative because you can declare them, they're explicit, they can come to your conscious memory and you can state them, but they're semantic because they're not an experience, they're just a little factoid. So that's how I remember those. Non-declarative is still a subtype of long-term memory and it is things that are implicit or unconscious so you're not thinking about them but you still have them stored in your memory so there's three subtypes of those that I want to touch on the first one is procedural so it's just like um, I'm tying your shoes you don't have to think about it you don't have to think about whenever you drive to school you don't have to think about how the heck do I put my car in reverse you just do it right because your brain has that memory stored theoretically infinitely and so it's just a procedure, it's just a task that you um, do. And, and, and they'll usually bring up some kind of motor task if they're testing you on procedural memory. Associative memory is not very often tested and neither is non-associative memory. They're, they're, they are tested, especially associative material or memory. That's one of the most high yield tested topics on the MCAT. But it's tested in the 
in in the vein of classical versus operant conditioning. It's just the idea of how do we associate an experience with an emotion. So I'm not going to touch on those completely, but I had the I had our illustrator throw it in the graphic for completeness sake. The final high yield concept around memory is something called priming. And it refers to the idea of one stimulus leading to faster or stronger recollection of another stimulus. And this is the main reason that mnemonics work so well. So anytime that you're using a mnemonic, you're priming yourself. So let me give you a mnemonic that I learned today so I can explain it as priming. This mnemonic is crab. And the mnemonic crab describes the characteristic symptoms of multiple myeloma. So whenever I get an Anki flash card or a question on a test or even whenever a patient presents and they have characteristic symptoms of multiple myeloma or if I want to ask myself what are the symptoms of multiple myeloma, I will say, oh, the answer to the question where the symptoms of multiple myeloma is crab. Well, crab is not the answer. It's what it stands for. So I'm using the stimulus of crab or the memory of crab to make another stimulus much easier. And that stimulus would be the recollection of the symptoms of multiple myeloma, which would be hypercalcemia, renal insufficiency, anemia, and bone lesions. Take advantage of priming your MCAT prep. The rest of these, you know, just kind of memorize the definitions for the exam. It's not going to help you study any better to know any of these. But as a quick review, it's very important that you pay attention to the time periods around the individual um, fashions of memory for sensory memory it's less than one second for short term and working memory it's characteristically between one second and one minute and for long term memory it is characteristically anything over one minute although remember if the MCAT wants to test you on sensory memory it's going to be way less than one second if they want to test you on working memory it's usually going to be just a few seconds to a minute if they want to test you on long long term memory it's going to be well over one to five minutes so it's going to be probably hours days months years it's also important to know all these different definitions and be able to identify whether a certain experience belongs in the iconic or maybe the declarative memory section so be able to do that and a great idea is to think and have specific examples for each of these whether that be john's wedding as an episode in his life or maybe a example that is important to you and then the last thing is to remember that priming is associating one stimulus with another in order to make the second stimulus either easier or faster to recall and mnemonics are a great example of that that's it for memory thanks for watching the video if you have any suggestions on how we can improve this series then please let us know if, if you want a zero cost way to support us then please subscribe to the channel leave a nice comment below somebody said it looked like i had graves disease so comment what other diseases you think that i have we'll make sure to throw it in the group chat and, and talk just about how funny that is we appreciate all the support whether that be you know purchasing our books or or even just liking a video or leaving a comment and we look forward to seeing you in next week's episode